Hey everyone, this is Adam Ellen Boss from Nightlight Astrology, and today I'm really excited to present for you a live reading from one of my online classrooms. Now, uh, this reading is with a woman named Chelsea who gave me permission to use our reading on my YouTube channel today. Um, I wanted to present this to you guys for a couple of reasons. I think it serves a few purposes. One is that it's been a while since I've done uh, readings that are filled with, you know, actual craft, which I think is helpful because a lot of people take in astrology content, not only to, you know, get the scoop on what the latest transits are doing, but also because you're interested in learning about the subject of astrology and maybe how to read birth charts. And um, I, I address most of that in my classrooms, but um, in the past, I'd had more chart demos than I've had recently. And a lot of that's just had to do with the ongoing series that I'm doing and things like that. So um, I wanted to get back to that today. So that's one of the reasons why we're doing it. I hope that you'll be able to learn some things from it. Uh, maybe just I, for me, seeing how any astrologer reads a chart, even if my style or my approach or my way of looking at a chart might be different is, is useful. It's helpful to learn and, and grow from seeing astrological readings done. And the second purpose it serves is to pro promote my upcoming program, Ancient Astrology for the Modern Mystic, which begins on November 12th. This reading comes from one of my online classrooms and is these kinds of readings are a staple of my online programs for a few reasons. One, I like to be able to, after looking at, for example, in year one, we're looking at natal theory, which has to do with all of the basic delineation techniques for birth charts. What did ancient astrologers say about how to read a birth chart? What kind of factors can we consider? And how do we take that information and then make it accessible and relevant in a you know a modern setting with a, another soul sitting in front of us? So in order to demonstrate that, Toward the end of the program, as we are starting to work and practice on live or on charts that people bring into class, um, we also um, we sort of intersperse the um, practice sessions with live readings. So we have a live client who comes in. I sit down with that live client. I read for them just like I would Monday through Friday when I'm seeing clients in my practice. Everyone is um, silent off camera and microphone just observing. I'll have the reading with the client. And then after the client leaves, we then break down the reading and have craft discussion. And I talk about, you know, maybe what I would have done differently, what I thought really went well. Um, and people will ask questions about, you know, wh wh why did you do this? Or how did this happen? Or, um, and, and maybe ask questions about technical aspects of the chart that we didn't get into in the reading or whatever. So I wanted to give everyone also a sneak preview into what I feel like is one of the most valuable and, you know, kind of cool parts about my program, which is the amount of actual hands-on astrology that we do with real people. Um, so in my program, the last stretch, the last, let's say, 10 sessions out of 30 on the year, those two to three hours that we spend together, the first hour is a live client like Chelsea that you're going to see today. After she's after that reading is done, then she leaves and we sit down and, and break down the craft. So I hope that um, that being said, you will consider signing up for the new program. Um, it is called Ancient Astrology for the Modern Mystic. It begins on November 12th. Um, you can check it out on my website, which is nightlightastrology.com. So uh, check it out right here. Go into the courses page, first year course, scroll down. You'll learn more about the program overall. And as you uh, scroll down, you can also find out everything the program includes. And at the bottom, you can register. Now, we have uh, need-based tuition spots open. And I've been getting a lot of emails from people basically being like, I don't know if I qualify. And I actually wrote a post about this. I said, you know, there, there's sometimes people have guilt or shame around asking for help. Don't do it. Just just ask for the help. We're that's what they're there for. We have um, a certain amount of spots that are set aside for people to take advantage of. Um, so you know, if you're just if you're on a fixed income, that's qual that qualifies. You know, um, if you're someone who can afford it, then we ask you to just use the early bird payment or the payment plan. And if you're someone who would really like to take the class, but it's like you don't you don't want to put yourself into a bad situation, then use the tuition assistance. We're glad to help you out with that. So um, any questions about the program at all, email us info at nightlightastrology.com. And that being said, I also want to say a special thank you to Chelsea for letting us look at her chart. Um, and I just ask that in the comments section, 
uh, you know, just be kind. This is a person who's putting themselves out there for an entire YouTube audience to see after being in a relatively more private classroom environment. So, you know, in the comment section afterward, um, you know, just keep the comments really uplifting and supportive. I would really appreciate that. And I'm sure Chelsea will as well. Um, but yeah, that uh, is all I have to say. So I hope you guys enjoy the reading. Take it easy. All right. Well, uh, <clears throat> Chelsea, welcome. If you want to unmute yourself, we can. Hello. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. I can't hear the Good. volume. Uh, was that you, Chelsea, or was that someone else? Was not me. Okay, Delia, can okay. you? Delia, Delia, can you? I Is think that there's probably some feedback coming from Chelsea's um, mic. Do you happen oh, okay. to have like some headphones? Yeah, Andy? I can try that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's let's try that and just see if it helps a little bit. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Um, well, thanks so much for being our class guinea pig today. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so this you're you're coming in toward the really like the last quarter or so of a um, one year program for advanced students of ancient astrology. And the gist of the program is that every week I bring a new client in and read their chart. And then, you know, we kind of discuss and people get to learn by seeing a live reading. So it'll just be the two of us, but everyone else is kind of taking notes as they're thinking about how to become an astrologer. Um, so as much or as little as you feel comfortable sharing in this setting, obviously, is totally fine. Um, everything's confidential. And um uh, we'll give you a recording of the reading afterward, too, so you can re-listen to it. And if questions come up later, you could always email me, too. Um, how much of, of astrology are you comfortable with or do you already know, I guess? Um, is it something you do a lot? It is lately. Um, I first got into it via your channel two years ago. And uh, since then, I've delved into other creators material um but i would say that i'm pretty like moderately aware of astrology and how it works okay you know what um your audio and video are chopping up really badly so um let's just turn off our videos we'll just do it audio just so that that way we don't um hopefully we'll get better audio quality that way okay Okay, perfect. Um, so um, you, when you wrote in, uh, you mentioned some of the things on your mind to talk about today, but I think it really helps me for sure. And I think it'll help everyone here today. If you kind of in your, like, give it to us in your own words, what would be, what's going on in your life right now? What would be most useful to talk about? Um, I can certainly make reference to what you wrote if you want, but I think it would be helpful to just kind of hear you articulate it, you know, here in person. Okay. Um, my name is Chelsea. I am 24 and I currently live uh, in New Jersey, down the shore of New Jersey with my mom and her husband. Um, since 2020, I hadn't really worked for a good almost two years until October of 2021. And um, that period of time without working was um, colored by a lot of grief for me, um, not necessarily for the pandemic, although um, it definitely helped to turn my attention inward to all that I did not really grieve. For example, um, just a, 
a childhood that was um, <clears throat> pretty difficult. Um, I have a single mom and a dad who wasn't really around at all since age 10. Um, my mom was pretty abusive as far as like verbal and, and definitely physical as well. And um, our relationship has matured though as I got older and now I live with her here in New Jersey. Um, she has softened and we're even enjoying like a wonderful sort of like calm period with Jupiter in my ha Aries house, the sixth house. Um, and I think of it as a, a gift. It's a way to develop compassion for the people around me, both experiencing grief and being in a place that I don't really see as my dream home or, and certainly not my, um, my end goal. So at first I would like to see if there can be any clarity for the next step I should take in order to um, find myself in a, in a happier, even happier way of, of living. And uh, not just one that I find difficult, but beneficial through that compassionate, um, uh, sad work that I've been doing for the past couple of years. Um, when you, you mentioned um, you're living with your mom still, I just wanna make sure I heard everything correctly. Yeah, so I, um, I left her home when I was 17, right out of high school. I moved around a lot uh, between Seattle, Las Vegas. And then uh, because of the pandemic, while I was living in Philly, this was uh, the safest place to be. So I moved back. Sure. And what would you say the biggest challenges of living with mom have been? Like you, you kind of mentioned it, it's been a work of compassion. Maybe you could just, whatever you feel comfortable with, but what, what's that been like? Sure. <laughs> Um, it's been very quieting for me. I didn't, I don't really feel like, uh, my mom or even the P the family she married into who I also live with here, um, really understand how to facilitate the growth of a person. Um, I never really felt like raised by her in that, like, Normally kids feel kind of exalted and then um, gently like coaxed out of their shell and then they develop a relationship with the person they are and the person their mom is. So mm -hmm. a lot of this time has really been colored by my trying to stay out of her way and also protect myself, even though the consequences um, don't seem like they would be as serious or as heavy as when I was a child. And for example, I expressed interest in something or like anger for another. Um, so I've been quiet here, but um, still trying to like get in touch with who I am just um, through my own relationship with myself and really avoiding her. Um, do you feel like there's something about, it, it sounds like in avoiding her, it's because, you know, there's maybe she doesn't validate or approve or like really see you or something like that. Or she, there's something about you that she thinks ought to be different or something. Mm. Um, yeah. So I think of my mom as a traumatized child in that, like, she doesn't really, um, she can respond as best she can to like, for example, my, if I were to come to her with, an issue I'm having with work with a coworker. Um, I just don't feel like she is very good at um, speaking to those issues from a place of like leadership and with all the compassion and patience and like, um, I don't know, diligence that a, like a mother should or my mother should. Mm. Um, so it's not, that she would like fly off the handle if she found out I was having an issue at work with that example, all the, but I don't feel like there is a lot to gain as well. At the same time, I find it more beneficial to me to just hide my life from her as a whole and let her see, you know, the, 
the meek sort of like quieter child that she's familiar with. Sure. So it's, it's it, it, just out of curiosity, does your, does your mom ever like, does she, is it like rage or anger or is there anything like that, 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 you know, her character, like imp great impatience or like character quirks like that, that have been hard to live with? Sure. She um, doesn't hand or handle anger well when it comes to things going on in her life. So if, you know, the plumbing needs work, the first thing she really does, like heighten her volume and really um, take out her stress on other people. Have you been, it sounds like you've been one of those people in some ways. Sure. When I was a child, um, before I fully got the fact that I couldn't always trust that mom was in a mood to hear what I have to say or something like that. Um, I definitely was like at the the end of her like yelling the other end. Um, is it just you two? Did you say you have siblings? That's right. Um, I have a younger brother who's 23 um, and all of my siblings are moved out of the house, including my older brother as well. Um, and my older sister. Okay, so it was just one, it was just your mom and the four of you? Correct. And did, did you, this is just helping me get a picture and it's helping me in, in turn understand some of what I'm looking at in the chart. Did, did the other siblings in your uh, family with your mom get better or more or different kind of attention? Yes. So, yeah, um, all of them or or no um I have an older sister she's the firstborn and my mom only really hit the girls and my my brothers didn't get out like scot-free either but their abuse was more like a little more a little less physical a little more verbal so there was so she was physically abusive too yes okay got it that must have been really hard. It must have been just like, you know, well, it's easier if I hide or go in a shell or kind of, you know, don't give her a reason, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's really tough. Um, it sounds like, well, you said you moved out at 17? Yes. Um, what, I guess what, I mean, obviously, aside from like, hey, I don't really want to be here anymore. Was there something you were pursuing a relationship or a destination or a group of people or, you know what I mean? Like, was there a reason that you moved outside of just wanting to get out of the house? Yeah, um, it certainly wasn't school. I was very overwhelmed by the prospect of college. So it wasn't for that, but it was for variety's sake. And finally, just being a part of a world that I, I was always told was bigger than the one that I came from. And um, my sister invited me to live with her the winter after I graduated. And that's what I did in Las Vegas. That's your older sister? Oh, yeah. And um, she was living in Las Vegas where and you grew up in New Jersey, right? Right. Yeah. So that's a big change when and you went there and it sounded like from your letter you got into like the service industry like you were serving tables or something like that yeah and that was in vegas it was was that a, a good happy place because you did mention that like you're not loving the people like the, <laughs> the chef and the you know like you kind of mentioned that i'm just wondering if that started there or if that's more recent since the year maybe since pandemic and moving home uh, it wasn't an easy place to work. I worked at um, a very famous diner on the Las Vegas Strip called the Pepper Mill. And uh, it was run by very sort of harsh uh, managers. And uh, I found myself crying a lot after work because it was, it was a big responsibility waiting tables compared to um, just making drinks as a barista and stuff like that. Right. <clears throat> um and you were there up until the pandemic, is that what you said? And then you moved home? No, actually, I moved around a few more times since Las Vegas. Um, a year after living in Las Vegas, I moved to Seattle, Washington, and uh, I 
I stayed there for three months, also waiting tables, um, until I was until I encountered a really uh, life changing event that would land me back in New Jersey. Oh, that's interesting. Are you open to sharing what that event was or how it affected you? Absolutely. Um, so I went on a trip in late May with my sister to Cuba after borders reopened there. And it was exciting. My sister and I had the best relationship at that point. But um, it was also a, a sort of coming of age for me. I was 19 and um, I had translated for the entire group of girls who traveled with us in a place that largely did not speak English. I'm fluent in Spanish. And um, I danced for the first time in front of other people. And it was a real expression of who I was and all that I could handle. And um, at the end of it though, my sister and I uh, had a big fight about the career path that I would choose after waitressing. I let her know that I wanted to become an exotic dancer um, like her and make lots of money and express like feel into my sexuality and things like that. And she told me that I just didn't have enough to do that. I wasn't enough. I was too emotional or weak or something. And um, we got separated in that foreign country um, for about 12 hours and I sort of lost my mind. Um, she was fine the whole time, but I couldn't, I imagined the worst things happening to her given that we left each other on like such bad terms. Oh, Ch Chelsea, can I pause you just for a second? Yeah. I have, because I I'm lost a little bit. I missed the part and I'm sorry if it's just my brain isn't working very well today, maybe. Uh, um, you were in another country? We went to Cuba, yeah. Ah, okay, okay, no, 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 I remember this now. Okay, sorry, I don't know why, I'm just having like little short-term memory lapses right now. So, okay, so you were, you went, you were in Cuba and you were, were you just there just like hanging out? Yeah, it was a girl's trip. Okay, cool. So, but then you had this fight over telling her, hey, I wanna be a dancer, she doesn't like it. You get separated, you have this meltdown because, um you're not sure where she is or what could be going wrong. Exactly. Okay, keep going. Sorry to interrupt. Yep, that's okay. Um, I eventually, um, I, I found what it was like to like be an adult, so to speak. You talk about initiation a lot in your videos, and I would call this mine, mm. um, into like what it's like to uh, just encounter mortality or the mortality of someone very close to you. And so... Um, on the plane ride home after this big fight, we, I sort of like, my therapist calls it a grandiose fantasy that I had where I felt there was so much that was up to me and under my control. And um, I had this fantasy that like, I knew my sister and I would be going in very different directions. And what, what that could mean was um, she could die. My mom could die. I had, I was having a major anxiety attack on this plane, ho plane ride home. And, um, I couldn't keep it inside. It really expressed itself as like a tight, I thought it was psychosis at the moment, but it, I think I was experiencing something really like childlike actually, and, you know, fantastical, but certainly to a dark extreme. And so, um, I, left my life in Seattle on the prescription of my siblings and myself, because I, I was afraid to put it together after that. The, um, and I sought therapy in New Jersey while living at home with my oldest brother, Chris. Got it. So you had like a, like a, a major panic attack episode on the plane ride. Yeah. And then that kind of prompted you to move and go back to New Jersey and be around family and kind of try to put the pieces together. Yeah. That must have been, so that was the big event, that whole sequence. Mm -hmm. How do you feel now and how have things changed since then? I feel really familiar with the shadows now. And that's not to be like cryptic or weird. It's just, I feel mature about 
the anxiety that I feel, although it's not all, I haven't got it all together. Um, I go to therapy once a week and I um, have developed a really confident relationship with myself um, that, that says to that event, like bad things happen, but it's best to be aware of them and, um, you know, to try and be a discerning person who um, is vigilant about like the scary things in life. Yeah, bravo. That's awesome. That's great that Thank that you. was a takeaway from that. That's huge. Sounds like it was an initiation, exactly like what you were just saying. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um, so in terms of today and getting, I, I just love getting to know people. So thank you for, you know, just opening up and telling me a bit about yourself and your story. I know there's so much more, but that gives me some really, a really good sense of where things have been sort of lately and big narrative arcs in, in the story of your life so far. What could I do for you? What would be the most useful information I could give to you right now? I feel stagnated here. Um, there's a lot to learn anywhere I go. I know that now. And I, I do want a bigger, a different arc, right? Than the one that has me here still working for um, difficult people and from a, a home that doesn't exalt me. So my first question would be, what does the next chapter look like? And how do I sort of get there as far as a career or even, you know, the geographic location in which I live? So maybe when do I when do I leave New Jersey? When does the career, you know, plot line take another turn? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's clear. Um, I do have uh, one follow-up question, which is, I just want to um, be clear about this one piece. Are you still, I'm unclear. Are you still serving or are you dancing now? Oh, um, I never got into dancing. I'm a waitress still. Okay. Is that still a desire or is it something that you decided to let go of? I really let go of it. Yeah. Okay. And is there anything percolating? And, you know, this is what I'd like to do, or this is what I could see myself doing or have an interest in this or that, um, you know, outside of, of, of serving. I would love the, the opportunity to learn under for once in my goddamn life, like a um, a leader, one that I respect and admire. So I would take any position under the right person. Um, however, my past also <clears throat> has included um, a, a hostile employer, uh, employee. That's what I was doing right as the pandemic hit. And I noticed that that made me really happy as well, working with travelers. Oh, uh, a hostile, like stay. <laughs> I thought you meant hostile as in like, you know, aggressive or something. Oh, no. Okay. So you worked at a hostel where that was in uh, Jersey. That was in Philadelphia. Okay. So you could see yourself maybe working in around travel or something like that. Yeah. But on just to be clear, um, could are you have any interest in living abroad or do you see yourself like living in you know in the US? I would love to live abroad. Yeah, so it sounds like there's yeah, it just I don't know, it just kind of felt that way when you said that. Um so okay, so let's focus on that first. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about your birth chart to give you some background, and then I'm gonna tell you where uh the planets are heading and when. I think that some movement is likely to happen with regard to, you know, location or career. Does that, does that sound like a good start? Yes, please. Okay, great. So I, there's three places in a chart, three planets, I should say, that are just absolutely crucial to understanding the, the destiny that the soul is here to live out. And those are the sun and the moon, obviously. And the rising sign, more specifically, the ruling planet of the rising sign. So for you, that's the sun and moon and Mars. 
Now, um, the sun and moon are in the 12th house in Libra. Uh, a new moon in Libra is really interesting. You're, you're born right at, at the uh, time that the a new moon cycle is beginning. Now, do you watch the moon in the sky? Does that make sense when I say that? Yes. Okay, cool. So new moon babies, in a sense, you could say from the perspective of the unfolding of the soul's experience over many lifetimes um, would signify that there is like a, a seed being planted. It's, it's karmically, there's something new that's going to be growing in the garden of life. And usually that newness brings with it a lot of challenges because you're, it's like a new pattern or a new theme that's trying to be established. For example, in the movie, you everyone's seen a movie like this. There might be someone who is, um, you know, like a, like a what do they call it? A shrinking violet, and they're shy, and actually their destiny is to become, you know, maybe really much more outgoing or something. And you've seen this movie, you know, it's it's the 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 story arc is about them sort of learning to be more confident or something. So in a sense, that's like a new moon because the new moon is invisible and over time it shows itself and it grows big and bright. Um, when people are born under new moons, it doesn't mean that they'll they'll have to develop confidence because they're shy, but it, something is going to develop and come to be seen. And usually from a rather relatively obscure or sort of less visible place. And that, that arc of invisible to visible sort of shapes the lifetime. Now, what's interesting about your chart is that the sun and moon are in Libra, which is the home sign of Venus. And Venus is in your first house. So one of the things that we would say that you're here to develop, and I believe this probably is partly why the fantasy of dancing took hold of you so strongly. And you had also this beautiful moment of dancing for other people that made you feel really good about yourself, even if you didn't end up, you know, becoming an exotic dancer. Because one thing this new moon would be pointing to would be the development of Venusian qualities. Well, what is Venus, especially when Venus is in the first house, the house of the body, mind, psychology, appearance, it would mean that you're going to be developing from invisibility to visibility, the qualities of Venus, beauty, attraction, love, desire, eroticism, uh, art, you know, that could be dancing, or it could be just owning your wardrobe more or feeling sexier as you get older, or feeling more empowered in your sexual nature or identity, whatever that may be. Or for some person, the exact same signature could mean that, you know, I've seen similar signatures, for example, in the charts of some of my clients who maybe came out as gay in high school. It could be the kind of thing where some element of your psychology when it comes to sexuality, desire, love, beauty, art needs to or is in the process of developing and becoming brighter, more visible, and sort of stronger. So I would say that one of the major uh, plot lines of your lifetime will have to do with progressively feeling more at home and stronger and more comfortable with Venus in the way you identify and express yourself in the world. And that will probably have something to do with uh, maybe what you do for a living or qualities that have to come out before the right doors open that really kind of match with the empowered nature of who you are. So I think there's like something like a Venus homework project in this lifetime about incorporating that. And Venus and Scorpio, Venus and Scorpio is edgy. You know, um, it's funny. I just today, moon, moon's in Scorpio, of course, as we're talking, by the way. And moon in Scorpio uh, is also opposing Uranus as we're talking. The planet of individuation, a planet linked to individuation, which means, you know, really taking those bold steps to become oneself. So I, I find it really interesting because I was thinking about this earlier today, and I've just been really, really moody since the moon went into Scorpio. 
And um, I've heard this song and it was, I, I don't know, I don't know how into music you are or not, but it was called, I think it was called I See Red. And it was just so like evocative. And I was just, I was driving and I was listening to it. And I was like, my God, I'm just really feeling this. This moon in Scorpio has just got me so, you know, intense. And, um, <laughs> you know, and just like, like that, that's Scorpio, you know, Scorpio is not just like feel beautiful and pretty and don't be shy. It's no, it's feel powerful, evocative, feel deep and in, intensely. It's, 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 really grabbing life by the neck. I know that sounds a little intense, but it, <laughs> it's, it's, um, there's a real edge to it. I, I did a video some years ago called um, Scorpio. I think it was called Scorpio or Venus and Scorpio. It was called the horror of true love, something like that. And you would, I think you might really like that video anyway, because it gets at what I'm trying to say, which is that, you know, you're a Libra full moon or new moon, excuse me, with the dispositor Venus in Scorpio in your first house. So it's, it's eruptive, it's volcanic, it's there, there's something that needs to be released from within. And it's, it's Venus, but it's, it's Venus with some blood on her fangs. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So and that doesn't have to be a literal thing where you become a jerk or egotistical or anything. But I think there's it's it's honoring the, the primordial power of Venus in your body, in your psyche and, and so forth. So now it's complicated by the fact that this new moon was happening in your, your 12th house. And the 12th house is a very complicated place. Ancient astrologers called it the evil daimon. That was the name they gave to it. Um, so there's a number of ways that this can be read first. Um, the new moon in that house that wants to sprout and become visible can struggle to do so because of basically oppressive forces. Now, those forces are karmic. They're part of your fate. They're beautiful in the way that they actually are serving your unfolding, but they're also oppressive. And the oppressive nature of those forces is also amplified in your chart by the opposition that the new moon has to Saturn a fallen Saturn in the sixth house in Aries, a place of conflict and uh, illness and aggression and uh, a, a place of servitude and slavery. Um, when I look at your chart and I see that the new moon is in this house with Venus in the first, I just think I painted a portrait for you of, of what what's trying to become visible from the, the new moon seed. But in the 12th house and opposite Saturn, there are afflictions. There's a mother who makes you maybe at times feel like you have to shrink or hide yourself. There's an environment that you grow up in that's a feeling of hostility awaiting you should you try to express yourself or try to be heard. There's violence. There's abuse. Um, there's also uh, probably from that a lot of fear and anxiety and even paranoia that can live in the the space of the psyche who's trying to just be itself and when you had this really big moment i'm just kind of spitballing here but when you had this really big breakthrough moment around dancing you know and then you all of a sudden you met this resistance from your your sibling i can imagine that would have been deeply triggering because here you are starting to feel free and then there's someone again from the family saying no 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 that's not who you are you ought not to be this or that or whatever um and then there's this this sudden traumatic event where you lose each other for some hours and so forth and um so to me i, I the story that you're telling i can see in the chart and i suspect that one challenge with your story has to do with rising up again and again uh and you know saying to myself no i'm i'm i am strong i'm beautiful i'm confident i'm i'm edgy there's a that kind of little bit of a wild venus that needs to come out and there may be many phases in life or different jobs or different places you live where you know it, it it's kind of like 
trying on different versions of that uh, that Venus, you know, and figuring out what it means to live into that. And I would give yourself just be very, very patient with yourself in in getting there and knowing that along the way, there might be shitty bosses, there might be, you know, family members that oppress or environments that make you feel like you have to shrink away and hide or it's the courage over and over. It's the courage to persist in the path of individuation and of allowing Venus to be confident and strong and bold um, that I think will serve you most. It's like the one of the themes of Saturn and Aries to me uh, is survival because um, Saturn and Aries is like, especially in the sixth house, is a, a theme of like hardship and persecution and I, when I think of Saturn and Aries in the sixth, honestly, I think of the ancient all over the globe reality of people being enslaved by other people. And I think of the perseverance of spirit that's needed to live through that somehow and persist and, um, and re retain one's sense of courage and dignity, even though other people may be um, oppressive. So I, I and I, I think that the strength of Saturn and Aries is kind of like a stubborn determinedness, like I'm going to just be determined to um, keep, you know, you might you can knock me down, but I'll keep getting up kind of attitude. And, and I, I suspect that if you keep that with you throughout your life, that you will prevail. Now, one of the other things that I think, and then I'm going to give you some timelines here. So when you were born, there was uh, your ascendant ruler is Mars and Sagittarius uh, in the second house, uh, conjoined with Pluto. Um, as someone who also has Mars in the second house and you know worked with lots of clients with that placement over time, what to speak of it being paired with Pluto, one of the major themes that I see time and time again is the need for financial and material independence. So this is a Mars with Pluto that, you know, is, uh, well, let's put it this way. You could um, face the, the feeling of like your individuation is partly Venusian, but it's also partly about um, being financially um, sovereign, being a strong earner and uh, developing some degree even of wealth and probably through determination courage perseverance uh, healthy risk taking i say healthy meaning you know nothing that could harm you but um the the kinds of risks that mars and pluto needs to take along the way to financial liberation are um you know it it, it requires real grit like mars pluto is like a warrior and mm -hmm. it's a very similar signature, right, to Saturn and Aries in the sixth house, because Saturn and Aries in the sixth house is in Mars's sign. So it's disposed of by Mars with Pluto in the second, just kind of like be financially strong, you know, and that's a part of it, too, is this this gaining of financial self-sufficiency. Along with that, a home of your own. I picture for you in this chart having your own house or your own condo. Um, I think that's going to happen for you someday. I don't think it's too far away. I think in, I have some ideas about when that might happen. But I think that, you know, it's like, it, the, the, that new moon in the 12th is like, I've got to, I have to become the, you know, the, the beautiful being that I am has a little bit of an edge to it with Venus and Scorpio, right? But it's also very intelligent, balanced, poised, sensitive, very Libran. You know, Librans are very sensitive. Little dark edge with Venus. Okay, so that's what you're trying to become. Along with Mars and Pluto in the second, I will rise up and become financially strong. And then what do you see with uh, the ruler of that second house, Jupiter? In the fourth house of home and property, I'll have my own home. You know, it doesn't mean you have to have kids or anything. But I, I think that there is something about having your own home and your own voice and your own identity and your own financial self-sufficiency 
and working toward those things with determination, working continually over getting back up if you get knocked down, especially by oppressive sort of people or forces. That's what's going to make you a fantastically interesting and fun and probably very encouraging person to be around for other people as you keep aging and growing. So those are some of my takes on your chart, just kind of throwing some stuff out there and, and, and hope that they resonate for you. I wish I had the video on because you would get to see what I look like when I'm fully in love with what you're saying. It's, it's oh, always so, it's validating. Good, good. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, um, I will say that the the challenge in all of this is going to be the main, you have to maintain belief in yourself and um, don't overcompensate. That what I mean by that is when you face an oppressive force, um, just keep being you in the strongest, uh, firmest, but least reactive way possible. By that, I mean, you know, sometimes when we face oppressive forces, we will more deeply radicalize our identity as a response. You can't change me. You can't tell me who I am. I'll do, you know, I'm going to put on, uh, I'm going to just start walking on stilts to show you, you know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So like the more, one of the temptations that I could see happening would be like, when, when you're trying to do something that feels right to you and you, you get met with resistance that you, you may double down on your sense of agency, dignity, sovereignty by, um, you know, almost like redefining yourself in more and more radical ways. And I think that's something to be careful about uh, because you don't want to just get into a never ending loop of identity experimentation uh, to the point where you can't settle into a, a, a good, at least a good feeling or sense of yourself. Like you travel all you want, experiment all you want, but um, you know, it's, it's, I think there's something to be said also about settling in deeply, settling into who you are. Does that help? Yeah. I, you know, I never considered the, uh, the prospect that I could double down on like some extra edgy versions of myself just to sort of, um, provoke others further or, you know, establish my annoyance with them. But it's it's helpful to to have that clue for the future. Yeah, I mean, for example, you have some transits coming up, like Uranus opposite Venus. As someone who's going through that right now, um, you know, it's like whenever someone tells me recently, I'm not always like this, but when someone's like, "You can't do this," I just decide to do something even worse. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, and it, I think that that kind of like oppositional defiance. I've heard that phrase tossed around like clinically for kids. I, I mean it really loosely. I think that you, you, there are times where it's appropriate to defy, resist, and maybe further individuate as a result. There's also a time to be really careful that um, it doesn't just become a, a pathology of, of pain. You, you know what I mean? Like, it's the pain mm -hmm. that drives the need to like constantly recreate myself because then it's going to be harder to land on a career or a craft or several things you do that can really make you money or make you feel really good about yourself because the identity won't be stable enough to sort of carry um, some of the legacy that I think you're, you're really trying to build for yourself. Mm. Yeah, I, I see myself as uh, somebody who can adapt a lot and who finds joy in doing so often. So perhaps what could be necessary at some point is um, to stay sometimes and and continue with, with one path, one job, perhaps. <clears throat> yeah, um, you're still, you're 23, right? I'm 24. Oh, 24, sorry. Um, so I think there's a lot of time to still explore. I think that's a natural part of our 20s archetypally all the way up till the Saturn return around 29 or 30 is to do that exploring 
And I think we, you know, we need to get familiar with ourselves. And there's lots of things that we just can't know. And in the initiation of a phase of your life, I think, has a few more really good twists and turns to come. And so I don't want to be discouraging of that. But I think it's just sort of a reminder that, um, you know, when it comes to the new moon in the 12th, the other thing is you don't want the, the one of the, I don't know, uh, one of the difficult delineations associated with the 12th house is perpetual wandering. Um, and then when we have that linked to Venus in the first house of identity, that's where I'm, that's where I'm kind of coming from. It's like, I don't, I don't want you to feel like you never have a home inside yourself uh, because mm -hmm. th that's the thing that, and that's the thing you mentioned in your childhood too, was like, there wasn't, you didn't get validated, encouraged, brought out gently, all of those things you said. And so in some ways that really challenging duty is, is it's left for you to, to do. <laughs> yeah, I know, know. Right. Like that's insane. Right. So it's insane. But you're not alone. You have allies. There are always guides and helpers along the way. Um, the things you love are especially important guides and allies because the things that we love raise us in many ways. Um, so, you know, stay close to what you love and what you love will love you. And I think that's part of how all of us are are raised outside of what our parents can't do for us because all of our parents have deficiencies and some far worse than others. But, you know, that's, that's how I've come to understand the things that I've loved in my adult life have raised me in many of the ways my parents never could. <laughs> so I just think about that, but if that's helpful. Yeah. Um, well, Chelsea, I have some thoughts about timing in terms of like, okay, when could we see some interesting twists and turns with, you know, regard to career or maybe moving or something like that? Does that sound, does that sound good? Yes, please. Okay, cool. So I'm going to put up the by wheel. All right. Tell me if you can see it on the screen. Should be a double wheel lit now. Yeah. Okay, great. Now I'm going to plug in. Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto's already in. Now, to me, the most interesting change, like kind of coming up soon, is depicted right here. Here's Pluto entering your fourth house. That's the place of home, family, roots, environment. Um, it's entering that house in late March of 2023. It's going to be there until June, if I remember correctly. Let me just go forward. So, yeah, it's it's into June. That ingress, I think, could represent a change of location because Pluto usually makes a splash of really affecting the topics of the house it moves into. So here it's moving into the house of home and family between March and June of 2023. Could we see a change of location or some shakeup around the roots. That, I think that's probably the most imminent possibility for a move. But Pluto in that house is gonna be doing some work for a while. And um, one of the transits that I think could be really revolutionary for you is going to be Pluto's transit of Uranus, which is in March of 2026. That could be a really substantive change of roots to the point where I wonder if you're even living abroad. This is why I asked this earlier when I was looking at your transits, uh, given what you had mentioned in your letter, I thought, well, isn't it interesting that at the same time you'll have exalted Jupiter in the ninth house of foreign countries, while at the same time Pluto hits Uranus in the house of home and living environment and Uranus really likes to shake things up. So could this be a time of at least traveling abroad for an extended period of time? Um, I think that there might be a real, a really meaningful segue that takes you abroad somehow and that contributes to this path of self-discovery. Um, it's interesting to me that this starts happening at the outset of your Saturn return 
as you're nearing 30 years of age. Um, I think that would make sense. It's a perfect time. Saturn will oppose your sun and moon, and you will you will have grit to grind up against existentially in a in a moment that looks like you could be really sorting out who you are and and working through another wave of that feeling of opposition to who you are either within or without and and deciding you know well i'm going to relocate or i'm going to travel or while traveling you're having some pretty profound insights about where you want to go with your life so to me this is just an absolutely um critical phase uh, right around your Saturn return, put it 28 to 30 years old. Um, now, a little bit more near term, you had asked about relationships. Um, first of all, uh, do you do you date men, women, anyone? Anyone. Okay, so in terms of like a partnership coming in, are you interested in like a committed partnership or marriage and all of that stuff? Or is it kind of looser than that at this point? I'm open to however deep the commitment should go. Right. I ask because some people are like, look, I'm not into marriage. I'm never going to get married or I'm polyamorous or you just never know. Hmm. So here's Uranus opposing <clears throat> Venus um, by the summer, next summer. So this is a really interesting moment because typically Uranus Venus moments coincide with, but well, for you, it would be further individuation, but along sexual relational lines. Um, so identity, sexuality, um, and relationship, the need for independence and freedom, but also the need for experimentation and exploration of uh, you know, love and commitment. Those themes are really peaking next summer. Uh, at the same time that Venus, by the way, will be retrograde. Uh, Venus will be retrograde um, for a bit in Leo um, in your 10th house of career. So I, I wonder if next summer, it's also, you know, questions about love and relationships kind of coinciding with some meaningful changes in the workplace. So I think that, you know, some of these changes around work, uh, you know, there's a number of different timelines. You see some stuff in the spring of 23, maybe you're changing locations, probably changing jobs. In the summer of 2023, there's a lot of relational stuff on the table, seems to also coincide with some things that work. So um, yeah, in terms of the just the big picture, it looks to me like, um, you know, love is definitely in the cards probably in the next year. Um, I, I, it, it's hard to say how substantive it would be with Uranus because Uranus often comes and helps us grow but through things that are very unexpected and and like um they have a, an impact on us but they're you know uranus is not necessarily the planet of commitment <laughs> you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's uh it's more like um uh you know a flash mob at the mall that does a dance or something <laughs> you know it's a little bit more like that so We'll see what that brings, but um, yeah, next next August looks like it's very sparky um, around love and, and then a little bit in the workplace too. Okay, well, um, those are just a few transits that you know I thought were worth mentioning. Um, do you have any questions about that or anything else I could look at to maybe fine tune or say something different? Oh, um, just on those subjects or anything? Anything. Okay. Well, if I could mention that uh, most recently in my life, the biggest thing that's going on is this question about God. And I'd written into you a couple times about with questions that I'd had um, on some of your Bhakti videos. And oh. it's really been a heart opening experience just this week to be on part eight already of your Bhakti Upanishad. And um, I just want to see if anything is, uh, if that's indicated at all on my chart and if, you know, well, what steps I might take to further that relationship or further discover my place, a part of that. Let's see if we can turn our videos back on here since we're just about out of time. Maybe I can at least see your face a little bit while we talk about God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, maybe the video connection will be better now. I don't know. Okay. There you are. Cool. Um, 
Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a great uh, question. Let me adjust myself a little bit here. Um, now, this is just me. I, I don't particularly think that um, the any spiritual path is determined by the stars. Um, I believe the stars may mirror a time at which we become more interested or something like that. Or, or our commitment grows or deepens. But I truly believe that the, the choice to start taking transcendental activities into our life, so to speak, is totally free will. Um, a combination of, of grace and, and free will. And it happens uh, despite whatever the birth chart says. And in fact, as soon as one takes the spiritual life, I, I feel that the nature of what transits have to say or can do start to change in bhakti philosophy when a person starts on the path of yoga it's said that the nature of their karma changes because essentially it goes from mechanistic laws of the universe to a, a personal connection to the intelligence behind the mechanics and that means that your karma changes it changes at least in how you experience it so First of all, I just think that if you're taking an interest in it at all, from the bhakti philosophy standpoint, that probably means that you have samskaras in your soul already of a spiritual nature, which, which means this is not your first rodeo thinking about or taking up spiritual thoughts or activities. And um, that's a really good sign. Uh, first of all, I'd just say like, you know, you're... Sometimes people are, I'm interested in, in this stuff and what comes next. And I'm kind of like, the first thing is to recognize that you're already doing what comes next. <laughs> you know, Just by being interested in it, you're already doing bhakti. Bhakti is just a, a way of saying that a soul has started to show a devotion to spiritual life. And it's just about continuing that. Um, take interest in spiritual things, take in spiritual topics, ask spiritual questions, find many different teachers who keep leaving the breadcrumb trails and helping you, not just one, but many experiment with different traditions that give you uh, a sense of um, happiness. Uh, and in, in that way, uh, you're doing bhakti. You know, that's what bhakti is. It's just devotion. So um, that's my first thing. Uh, in, in terms of your birth chart, um, you know, I again, I don't think there's one chart I've seen a lot of different people's charts who are very spiritual and not one of them has some sign of being more spiritual or something, you know? So um, I've seen a lot of people who um, have charts that you'd almost think this doesn't look like it has a lot of interest in spiritual subjects and it's, you know, it's very interested in them. So I don't really look to the chart for that. But if I were going to pick a, a time uh, or like a, a period in which I think something really spiritual could could develop, like a like a, a rapid period of, of growth around your spiritual interests, it would be when Jupiter enters Cancer in your ninth house, um, which is a few years away. I mentioned it already. Um, let me just show you by moving ahead. Um, so. So it comes in uh, right about the summer of 2025, and it's going to last about a year into 2026, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Let me just make sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, 2025 to, to six, it's going to go all the way until, what, about june july of 2026 so 25 to 26 now that's the period of time where i mentioned you might be going abroad too so going abroad spiritual topics but in the meantime my best advice if it's something that you're like hey i want to go deeper with this is um two of my mentors there's i have a number of mentors uh hari kirtan um and loka and vidarba they have classes on bhakti that they teach you may or may not resonate with them, but it's worth looking into if you want to learn more about bhakti in particular. Um, I go to Quaker meetings. I don't know if you've ever been to one, but man, they're politically 
progressive if you're into that. They they don't push that on you though. And um doesn't really matter what you believe. You just go and sit down for an hour of, of quietness. And in the quiet, sometimes people are led to share insights about their relationship with God that are really sweet. And there's no central authority. There's no scripture. There's a respect for scriptures and, and stuff like that, but it's very open. And so I go there as well. Um, mantra meditation every day, you know, th those kinds of things to me are really helpful. So take up one of them. And, you know, for me, I just cling to my mantra meditation it's every single day. It's like my lifeline. So if you have something like that, even if it's just 10 minutes of, of silent uh, meditation or something, um, or just taking a walk or writing in a journal and just privilege your inner life, um, because that's the Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says that when we privilege our inner life, that the universe illuminates us from within. Um, and gives us all the knowledge and information we need about what to do and how to make choices and kind of navigate the 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 star chart, you know. Mm -hmm. So I hope that's. I'm a writer. It is. I uh, I would journal as one of those options that you mentioned, and I do, and I have. Um, and it's very interesting to me that there is no actual indication of like spiritual path a part of the charts. I never knew that. Well, um, at least in my opinion, I think it's. Uh, it, it, it might, it might be a rather fruitless endeavor to, to try to look for that in the chart. Although in India, there are, uh, of course, there's traditions that will say that you can see how evolved the soul is and stuff like that. And I certainly don't have the ability though. So yeah, but anyway, um, Chelsea, thanks for being here today. Uh, hope that we got some good work done for you and gave you some good things to take away. This was very special. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. I'm so glad you could be here. And um, it's good to see your smile. I'm really like your smile. I wish I could have seen it the whole time. <laughs> oh, so no, I was, I was dancing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, keep dancing. I hope that you keep, I hope you never stop. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, have a great rest of your day. We're going to continue on with class. Um, I'll send you the, we'll, we'll send you the recording afterward. And if you listen back and have any questions, let me know. Um, if there's anything I can ever do for you, just uh, reach out. Thank you, Achuta. Okay. Take it easy, Chelsea.